Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been looking at the 60 characteristics of complex trauma, um, one per talk, because I wanted to go into a more in-depth understanding of these characteristics. And today, we're coming to addicted to chaos. And so what happens in complex trauma is that, especially in the environments where there's abuse, is there's just a lot of chaos, a lot of unpredictability. You never know what's going to happen on any given day. You feel like you're walking on eggshells all the time. There's just one thing going wrong or blowing up after another. And so for people that grow up in that environment, that becomes their normal. And something in their brain wants to keep that going on because that's where it feels the most comfortable. Somebody has said this, I get uncomfortable when everything is going well in my relationship. That's not normal to me. Normal is boring, and I don't know how to be in relationships that are like that. I continually seek out drama because that's what I know how to handle. So I want to start by giving you a test to see if you might be addicted to chaos and just if you just get one or two um, that are true of you, that doesn't necessarily mean you're addicted to chaos. But if you get most of them true of you, then you probably are addicted to chaos. So the first one is, do you usually yell and scream to make your point? Second, do you ramp things up in an argument in order to win? If you get sick, do you feel that everyone should know about it? When you argue, do you ever break things or knock them over? Does being calm or bored sound like the worst thing to you? Do you feel bored, unloved, or confused if your partner isn't regularly arguing with you? Do you ever yell at strangers if you feel that they are in your way? Do you hate it when you are not the center of attention? Is there usually a crisis to solve in your life? Do you ever break up or threaten a breakup with a mate often? Are you usually the one who starts fights? Do you sabotage life or relationships when they're going too smoothly? Do you like to gossip, especially when you hear some really juicy news? Do you frequently run late? Do you overshare on social media? When you have a problem with someone, do you post it on social media? Do you spend your time on social media letting people know why they're wrong? Are you easily drawn into sticking your nose into other people's business? Do you like to stir the pot? And the final one, do you like the identity of being a shit disturber? So 18 questions in that test. How did you do? And for some of you, you probably got all 18, and that would indicate a strong tendency towards being addicted to chaos. And so that leaves the question, why do people become addicted to chaos? And I mentioned briefly at the very beginning about a complex trauma family. And I want to develop that more because in my mind, being addicted to chaos usually comes out of complex trauma. And so the first thing to understand is that complex trauma is living in danger all the time. As a result of that, there's the fear emotion that is triggered by that danger, which releases cortisol in the brain and adrenaline. Cortisol is what gives you the energy to fight or flight. It amps you up. And so if you're in complex trauma, one of the consequences is you got cortisol happening all the time in the brain, which means you've got all this extra energy all the time because you're always on alert, ready to fight or flight. And so to the brain then, having that amount of cortisol becomes its normal. 
it becomes actually addicted to it. And so people begin to like the rush of, of drama, of risky behaviors, because it releases cortisol, gives them that normal rush feeling. And so what happens when you take that cortisol away, when life isn't about danger or survival? What begins to happen then is your brain goes, this doesn't feel normal. This feels boring. I don't like this feeling. Makes me feel kind of dead inside. And so what a lot of people do who've grown up with that constant cortisol in the brain is subconsciously every day they got to get the cortisol and adrenaline going. And so they use anger or drama, chaos, to get the cortisol and adrenaline going. Something else that is important to understand is that what happens in complex trauma is you're trying to survive physically. And in order to survive physically, you can't have any weakness. Weakness is makes you vulnerable to getting hurt. And so what the, the, the brain does is it begins to kind of examine the person to see, am I doing anything that is making me weak? Am I displaying any weakness? And so it has to murder parts of its soul. And we've talked about that in the past. But it murders the parts that they would consider weakness. But if you look at that, what you then have to murder are the parts of us that make us beautiful as humans. Tender emotions. So you have love, you have empathy, you have sensitivity to others. All of those are now considered weaknesses. They, they set you up to get hurt. And then beyond that, I have to murder my conscience, my warning system that I might not be doing something in line with love. And so now I murder another part of me. What happens inside a person as they shut down, murder parts of themselves, mainly emotions and conscience, they start to feel dead inside. They start to feel like a robot. And so what then do people do who've had to murder all the weak parts of themselves? What do they do to feel alive? Well, now I need adrenaline and cortisol. Now I need drama, risky behavior, chaos in order to feel alive. And so they have an addiction to chaos. Let me take that this a little bit further and just have you think about complex trauma and emotions. So in complex trauma, a child who's living in fear is exposed experiencing mainly negative emotions. And the brain does not like make negative emotions. It only wants positive emotions. So it tries to resolve the situations that are creating the negative emotions. But in complex trauma, those situations can't be resolved. And so the child continues to experience negative emotions with no resolution that is healthy available. So what do they do? They start to numb their emotions, disconnect from their emotions, stuff their emotions, don't care about anything. And what does that feel like? Again, it feels like you're dead inside. There's just nothing happening there. Not only are you not feeling the negative emotions, but you're not feeling positive emotions either. And so when you feel dead inside, what do you need to feel alive? You need cortisol and adrenaline. And what do you need to get cortisol and adrenaline? You need chaos. And so people become addicted to chaos. Now, let me take that further. Some people go so far that we would call it emotional anorexia. So when anorexia in relationship to food, what happens is we are all born with a hunger instinct. When the body needs food, it creates the feeling of hunger 
which says meet that need. But what happens with anorexia is you ignore that need. You ignore that need until you no longer feel it. Somebody said this, emotional anorexia is the compulsive avoidance of giving or receiving emotional care or nourishment. A person then, as they shut down their emotions, shut down their emotions, stuff them, stuff them, ignore them, They get to a place where they're unable to feel emotions or deal with emotions ranging from normal emotions all the way to crisis major emotions. They shut it all down so they don't even feel it. So somebody has said emotional anorexia is like living your life as though you are at the most glorious banquet with all the yummy, delicious pleasurable foods laid out on this amazing table, yet you choose to only pick the crumbs and leftovers to eat. This leaves you hungry and starved of the joy, love, pleasure, and desires that you want in your world because you are afraid of the sucky feelings that could follow. And so complex trauma, where there's severe negative emotions happening, can lead a child to the place where they start emotional anorexia. They just shut down feeling. They're not even aware of emotions because they've disconnected for so long. So when you disconnect to that extreme, you feel very dead inside. And so what do you need? Cortisol and adrenaline. And what do you need to get cortisol and adrenaline? You need chaos. Now, there's a couple other reasons how complex trauma contributes to the addiction to chaos. So the first one would be a child who's not validated for doing good. They do well in school, in sports, they're obedient, they help around the house, they don't get validated. They get criticized, they're never good enough. And so one of the things that some children can do is they begin to realize the only time they get validated quote-unquote, from their parents is when they do something bad. And so now they create chaos. They create drama because that's what gets them validation from their parents. And then if they get known as kind of the bad child, that's their identity, but it's still a validation of sorts. And so they're addicted to chaos because it got them validation. For others... They have parents who they try to connect with all the time, but their parents are too busy, wrapped up in their own problems, addictions, mental health issues, physical health issues, problems with other child, pressures from work, that the parent doesn't connect with the child. But the child realizes something, in some cases, that the parent actually does connect with them when they do something wrong. Then the parent is in their face, looks them in the eye, gives them their full attention. And they realize, wow, I like connecting. I don't like the the pain of being punished, but I like the feeling of being connected. So I will create drama to continue to be connected. And then others learn that they can connect with friends through gossip. So when there's somebody else going through a problem, there's chaos in somebody else's life, they can talk to their friends and say, did you hear about, did you hear about? And it makes them feel connected to their friends like they belong, even respected if they bring this new juicy news. And then for some, there's what we would call trauma bonding. They can talk to other kids who have gone through the same trauma And they connect with them because they have their trauma in common. They don't have anything else in common, but they have trauma in common. There's another purpose for drama and chaos in complex trauma. And it's in unhealthy relationships. It's the only tool that some people know to get a relationship from a bad place to what they would see as a good place. 
So let's imagine that your relationship is going along and it feels boring. Nothing's happening or it's starting to get a little more tension. Stuff isn't being dealt with or you're a little more irritable with each other. And you don't like that. So how do you resolve all those problems and get back up to an emotional high where you feel very connected? So what some people do, and you can see on the graph, is they create a crisis. The crisis then is a huge shouting match, whatever, but afterwards, everybody just is on their best behavior. There's makeup sex. There's being super sweet to each other. There's a honeymoon for a period of time. And so what people realize is that whenever a relationship is struggling, the only tool that they have to try to fix that is to create chaos. And that will take it back up to a honeymoon. Now, the problem with that tool is that over time, you don't stay as long in the honeymoon, and the crisis has to get worse, and then you stay longer in that negative space before you get a little break in a honeymoon. And so it eventually stops working. But for a while, chaos seems to be the solution to relationship problems. There's an eighth reason why people from complex trauma become addicted to chaos. And this is all about our autonomic nervous system. And I'm going to do this in very much layman's terms. So if you're a medical person, I might not use the terminology exactly as you would or be as precise as you would like, but I hope it will help people just have a very basic understanding of our autonomic nervous system. So it has two parts. We have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And they are designed to work together to help each other. So the sympathetic nervous system is activated whenever you face a threat, any type of perceived danger. And so the sympathetic nervous system gives you the energy to fight, flight, it's survival. After you're out of the danger, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and it brings calm. It helps you relax. It helps your system recover from that big burst of energy from your sympathetic nervous system. Now, the tragedy to me of complex trauma is that you're always in danger. And so your sympathetic nervous system is always being activated. The parasympathetic can't kick in because you can't relax when you're in constant danger. But being in constant danger, always using your sympathetic nervous system, requires a lot of energy. So just think of it this way. Your body uses the food that you digest as energy. When it doesn't have that to draw on anymore, it uses fat reserves. And then it can supercharge by using cortisol, adrenaline, and that gives your sympathetic nervous system energy. And then for some people, drugs enables them to continue to have energy to get through their day. It keeps feeding the sympathetic nervous system to keep you on guard and alert. Now, just so you understand that, when the sympathetic nervous system is engaged, the emotions that you experience are mainly anxiety and anger can be part of that. Further, characteristics of the sympathetic nervous system being engaged are you have excess energy. That means then you have trouble sleeping. You have an overactive mind. You have difficulty being present with somebody else and focusing on their conversation. And you are hyper vigilant. Vigilant. That's all your sympathetic nervous system in action. It's driving the vehicle. So, if you're in complex trauma and the parasympathetic nervous system can't kick in, 
you're going to burn yourself out if it's just the sympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic does a couple things to try and interrupt the sympathetic nervous system to let your body relax, to recover from the expenditure of so much energy in your sympathetic nervous system. So a study that's come out around depression says that one of the things in complex trauma, when the sympathetic nervous system is going all, all the time, one of the purposes of depression is that your parasympathetic nervous system trying to shut down your sympathetic nervous system, trying to give you space to recover. It, so it shuts you down. It takes away motivation. It slows everything down, trying to help you recover. Now, what is interesting to me is if you're still in danger, now you're going to have depression and anxiety working at the same time. And many of you can relate to that. Now, what happens if you're still in danger is you have to ignore the depression. So that solution ultimately doesn't work the way the parasympathetic nervous system wanted it to work. So you keep burning up energy, and then finally the parasympathetic nervous system says, we're going to burn out. We're going on strike. And you have a physical breakdown, a mental breakdown, but you burn out. And that really is the kind of the last-ditch effort of your parasympath parasympathetic nervous system to save you from destroying yourself. I think there's another thing that some people can do who are drug addicts. So they use drugs to fuel their sympathetic nervous system, but they also use drugs to kick in their parasympathetic nervous system to help them relax from all the stress over here. So now you're your own pharmacist as you try to keep yourself going. And then I think there's another thing that the body does. If your sympathetic nervous system has been going all the time and there's just cortisol, 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 I would say from my own experience that the body becomes allergic to cortisol. That means now if you're in a stressful situation, and cortisol is released in your body, instead of it giving you tons of energy, it makes you feel like you got hit by a truck. It makes you feel tired. It makes you <clears throat> feel like you've got a hangover almost. And so it's now your body is saying, we are going to go to extreme measures to protect you from ever kicking in your sympathetic nervous system because you've messed up your body. And so we're going to make you allergic to cortisol and adrenaline. And I know people who would refer to themselves as being allergic to adrenaline and cortisol. It has the reverse effect in them that it was designed to have. So what do you need to understand as you look at recovery from addiction to chaos? Well, let's stay with this sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system and complex trauma. Do you see that your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system are way out of balance? You've used your sympathetic almost all the time, and you've hardly used your parasympathetic. And so for you to get healthy, you have to retrain your autonomic certain nervous system so that your sympathetic and your parasympathetic work together in a balanced way. But doing that will feel very boring. Because now, now when you have your parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system kick in to help you relax more often, and you're not triggering your sympathetic nervous system, life will go smoother. Life won't have the drama, and it will feel boring. So understand this. 
as you seek to gain a healthy, sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, understand that it takes a long time to retrain your autonomic nervous system. One of the things that you can do as you're retraining it is be aware of the things that trigger your sympathetic nervous system today to function too much. Again, you can slide into that. That's your normal. That's your default setting. And you can slide into that without even realizing it. And so learn your early warning signs. So the things that can trigger it are stressful situation. Also, anytime you go through a change where there's an element of the unknown, anytime you're really angry or anytime you're feeling good, all of those can trigger your sympathetic nervous system. And the warning signs is you'll find yourself more irritable. You'll have trouble sleeping. You might sleep for a couple hours and then you're wide awake. Your brain is going more than normal. You have difficulty being present to people in conversations. You feel tired, but instead of giving in to the fatigue, you just say, dig a little deeper and push. Push yourself through it, and you become impulsive. So if you see any of those warning signs, that is a dangerous place for you. And so how do you train yourself to have your parasympathetic nervous system kicking in regularly? So what they have found is breathing is important. Deep breathing, as you exhale, it helps to engage your parasympathetic normal system. Second thing. A lot of people who have a sympathetic nervous system that's out of balance, when they get up in the morning, their sympathetic nervous system kicks in. They rev the car engine up to 10,000 RPM, and they go and go and go until they drop into bed. The problem is, is it takes a little bit of time to unwind from 10,000 RPM to 1,000 RPM. So they go to bed and they lie there looking at the ceiling for a couple hours. And so what is helpful for many people is to start unwinding in the evening. And so that means no intense conversations, no intense movies that are going to get you wound up, no conflict, no intense meetings going out in the evening. So those are things that you can be aware of. I need to start cutting some of that out of my life so that I can start unwinding in the evening, so that when I go to bed, I'm ready to fall asleep. Something that is also helpful to do is to unwind throughout the day and just be present with yourself. Slow the RPMs down and say, how am I doing? Where's my stress level at? What emotions am I feeling? What am I feeling physically right now? Get in touch with yourself. And be aware of all of the things that in your life that might create stress. Now, you need to be aware that if your sympathetic nervous system has been activated, it does not want to slow down and be present to yourself. It wants to keep going. And so you have to be able to just sit and do some deep breathing or yoga or something that helps you slow it down so you can be present to yourself. So I hope this is helpful to you. But I think what you can realize is that this is going to be very challenging to do in recovery, to break your addiction to chaos to get your parasympathetic nor nervous system trained so that it is in balance with your sympathetic nervous system. So what happens in recovery is I begin to realize if I'm going to make it in recovery, I need a routine. I need certain things I do every day, which means I need structure. But for somebody that's coming out of chaos, 
routine and structure feels boring. And then the other thing that happens in chaos, in recovery, is that as your life gets healthier, you have fewer problems. Relationships go more smoothly. Job goes more smoothly. There's less stress because you've learned how to set boundaries and say no. But what happens when things are going smoothly? Your brain says this is boring. And so what can happen for a lot of people is that they sabotage everything that's good in order to go back to chaos, which feels normal. So be aware of the times when you start sabotaging the good things of your life. Another element of what happens when things are going good for many people is it triggers something deep in their brain that says everything's going too smoothly, the other shoe's about to drop. Something bad must be about to happen, so let's get it over with. Let's sabotage this good stuff. So the bottom line, what I want you to understand is this. If you've been addicted to, to chaos, and now you're moving into a healthier, balanced life, you're going to a new normal. So your old normal was unhealthy, but to your brain, it was your normal. To go to a new normal, to your brain feels weird. It even feels wrong, unhealthy. But don't worry. If you stick at it, it will soon start to feel good. So you will go through a time where it feels weird, awkward, but that's just because you're retraining yourself to a new normal, a healthy normal. Well, I hope that gives you some help as you work to have a healthier life. That's the end of part one. I'm going to take a short break. Then I'm going to come back and do part two, which is the Christian part. If you're not interested in the Christian part, we don't take any offense to that. You're free to go. We'll see you next Friday. But to everybody else, I'll be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We've been going through the life of Peter, one of the 12 disciples that followed Jesus during his three years of ministry. And we're finding him to be a very interesting guy that people from complex trauma can learn a lot about. And what we're coming to today is Peter went through a, a couple of days where it seemed like everything he did was wrong don't know if you've had days like that. It just, you want to do the right thing, and it always seems you do the wrong thing. You disappoint people here. You hurt people there. It, it's just frustrating. And that's what these couple days were like for Peter. So let me just read it to you from Matthew 26. Jesus told the disciples, and they're having their Passover meal together, tonight all of you will desert me. Peter declares, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. So let me give you kind of the context of what's been going on. You remember that going to the Passover feast, the disciples had been arguing about who would be the greatest. And they get to the Passover feast, and you need to understand that in that culture, 
they sat in a, around a table that was like a U. And there were specific seating arrangements for the host, for the trusted friend, for the, the favorite friend around. And on the other side of the table was where the servant sat on the very outside. And that is where Jesus tells Peter to sit. So Peter's just been arguing with some of the disciples about who's going to be the greatest. They get to this most important feast in Israel's life, and Jesus tells Peter, sit where the servant is supposed to sit. And then they're having their meal together, and Jesus says that, Peter, you're going to deny me. You're going to fail me. You're going to deny that you even know me. Now, I want you to think what that might have felt like for Peter. I think over the past few days, it's felt for him that maybe Jesus is upset with him. He's just done so many things wrong. Is Jesus punishing him for arguing about who is going to be the greatest? Why has Jesus got so little confidence in him? Why does Jesus say he's going to deny him? Is Jesus kind of frustrated and fed up with Peter and all of his foibles over the last three years? That he's just kind of saying, I'm done with you? I wouldn't be surprised some of those questions and confusion were happening inside of Peter. But here's what I want you to understand. Peter did not understand how weak he was. He thought he was stronger than he really was. And that's a common human thing. And many of you relate to that. Times when you thought you were stronger than you really were. So think of it. Peter claimed he would never deny Jesus. Jesus told him that he would, and he still said he wouldn't. He argued with Jesus, said, you're wrong, I'm right. Peter also claimed, if you paid attention there, that he loved Jesus more than the other disciples loved Jesus. And then Peter disagreed with Jesus on other occasions around that time, saying, Jesus, I, I'm even smarter than you in some areas. So he claimed to have the greatest loyalty to Jesus. He claimed that he would never deny Jesus. So what happens? They finish their Passover meal. They go from the room they were in down into a garden called the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to go with him a little further into the garden because he needs to pray. His heart is just breaking. He is struggling. And so he said, please watch with me. And Peter falls asleep. And then soldiers come to arrest Jesus. And, and Peter thinks he's going to help out. So he starts swinging his sword and he cuts a guy's ear off. And he just about messes up the situation big time, irreparably, by his impulsive action. And then Peter runs away. And then after running away, he comes back to a courtyard just outside the building where Jesus' trial was taking place. And he stands around a fire because it's cold. And as he's standing around a fire, he is confronted on three occasions by people saying, aren't you one of that guy's followers? And he says, I don't even know him. He denied him three times. And what happened was Peter's self-preservation instinct trumped his love for Jesus. He didn't love Jesus as much as he thought. And Peter went out and wept bitterly, we're told. Now, I want you to think about this. So remember, Peter has this problem. He thinks he's better than he is. How do you help people to see accurately who they are so that they don't have that inflated view of themselves? So true humility is they see themselves accurately, strengths and weaknesses. But how do you train people to grow in humility? Through failure. 
But for people from complex trauma, failure was always a bad thing. It never led to anything good. But what you need to understand is in a healthy family, the kind of family Jesus had set up, failure always led to good things. You always grew through failure. You learned through failure. And so what happens with this situation is God is saying, Peter, you are going to fail repeatedly over a period of a couple days, and these failures are not going to be just minor little things. They are going to be major failures, and you are going to grow from that. You are going to come to see your own weakness. You're going to see yourself accurately. You're going to see how badly you need me. And so this failure for Peter was the worst time of his life, but it turned into one of the greatest growth times in his life. I find that so helpful because we all fail. And if you're from complex trauma, you fail, you just think that's the end of it, and you want to beat yourself up, run away, whatever. But what God wants to happen in our hearts is we fail We learn about ourselves. We learn new tools. We grow. We grow in all kinds of skills, but we also grow in humility. And that is a core attitude to a healthy person. Let's pray. Father, none of us likes failure. I'm just so sure that for Peter, this was so hard to live with how badly he failed his master, his Lord, his best friend. And it just must have ripped him apart inside. But thank you that you redeem failure. Thank you that you turn it into learning and growth and maturing. And I pray for any here today that are failing or have failed recently, that you would just encourage them and help them and help them to run to you and let you teach them from it all. Amen. Well, that's the end of our evening. Thank you so much for being with us. I look forward to seeing you again next week.